Good afternoon, and welcome to Science World's monthly online family events. Uh, it is great to be here. Today is all about you getting to ask your questions of our favorite paleontologist, Dr. Scott Sampson from Dinosaur Train. Ooh, and we'll, of course, be asking our questions, too. I don't think we'll be able to resist. And this is my good friend, Brian Anderson, who is Science World's Director of Performance and Fun Times. Uh, this is Parker. He is the education curator for our current feature exhibition, uh, which is T-Rex, the Ultimate Predator. Uh, it's presented by the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Ooh. And we are actually here inside the dome at Science World in Vancouver, British Columbia. And we'd like to gratefully acknowledge that we're here on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. Yes. Uh, if you'd like to try out using the chat, we're going to be getting your questions and things in there. If you're joining from a particular area, let us know there. If you know the traditional territory of where you're joining from, yeah. we'd love to see that. Uh, if you'd like to share, if you have a favorite dinosaur, type sure. that in the chat. We can see all of the great things that you have coming towards us. Yeah, and we have some uh, folks helping us out. We have Chimgi and Larry who are on tech. And Larry, which side? The chat's on this side, right? Yeah, the chat's over on this side, so you can check that out. Put in uh, where you're coming in from and also your favorite dinosaur. Brian, do you have a favorite dinosaur? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I love, because it's fun to say, Pachycephalosaurus. Pachycephalosaurus. And in I fact, you know what? If you're a fellow dinosaur lover out there, there's something distinctive about the head of a Pachycephalosaurus. And if you want to put that in the chat, I'd be curious Ooh. to see if, uh, A, if, if you know, and B, if I'm remembering the dinosaur correctly. <laughs> I, when I was younger, especially, I don't know why the Triceratops always, because the T-Rex always got a bad rap as being like the, the dangerous one there. And so the Triceratops was always the, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but the hero of my stories for nice. sure. Let's talk a little bit more about our special guest today. Yeah. Uh, Scott Sampson serves as the executive director of the California Academy of Sciences, a fantastic museum, aquarium, pretty much anything you can imagine in San Francisco, California. If you get a chance, check it out. Mm -hmm. He's a dinosaur paleontologist, author, and science communicator. Uh, from 2016 to 2019, he was actually the CEO of Science Worlds here in Vancouver. So if you've ever visited Science World, let us know in the chat. If you've ever visited California Academy, let us know. He's also published numerous scientific and popular articles and authored multiple books, including How to Raise a Wild Child, The Art and Science of Falling in Love with Nature. But I'm guessing many of you are here because you are fans of Dinosaur Train. So if you've ever watched Dinosaur Train, you can also let us know in the chat. Uh, he was the host and science advisor of the Emmy-nominated PBS series, Dinosaur Train, produced by the Jim Henson Company. We are excited to welcome Dr. Scott Sampson. Hey, Dr. Scott. Hey there. Great to be with you folks again. Good to uh, see you there. Wow. Uh, I see people have put in some of their favorite dinosaurs. We've oh, this is kind of a, a we got a pterodactyl. Now, as a paleontologist, is that officially in the dinosaur genus or a species? No. Or, oh, it is. A, but it's really a, a prehistoric well, creature. It is. It is prehistoric. It's a reptile. It's even comes from the same group as dinosaurs called archosaurs, but it is not a dinosaur. That's amazing. There's so many oh, cool things yeah. out there. Seriously. Oh, and we also have uh, Monica is actually coming in a, from about a mile away from you right now, Dr. Scott. Amazing. Uh, whose favorite dinosaur is also a... Uh, Pachycephalosaurus? Pachycephalosaurus. <laughs> I love it. Uh, if I'm remembering this right, uh, Scott, the is it the skull of the Pachycephalosaurus that's distinctive? It's a thick dome on the top of the skull, and it looks yeah. like they're the, the Einsteins of the dinosaurs. I, but, I got you. I got but you. It's just thick bone, and they're like for butting heads and butting other animals mostly. Oh, fun. Oh, amazing. Love it. And okay, Scott. So, as uh, folks think of some questions that I might want to ask from you, uh, we want to see what's one of your favorite memories that you have from being CEO here at Science World? Golly, there are so many amazing memories um, from Science World. Uh, I think one that stands out for me. Um, is the very first event that we had for girls in STEAM. And we did this event and we said, well, we're going to do this girls in STEAM event. It's about getting girls and young women interested in science, technology, engineering, art, and math. We don't know if people are going to show up, but we think it'll be pretty cool. And then I just remember walking into the event and it was 
packed with people. It was just wall to wall folks, really excited, getting into all these different things that girls could do in science. And my understanding is that that event is still happening and um, very successful. And so that was a big memory for me, just because it's one of these things you try out, you don't know how it's going to go. And when it's a smashing success, you can't help but be pleased. It is still going. We're excited. November 5th, it will be happening. If you happen to be in Vancouver and want to visit the building, and we, I think we are, Larry, do we still have registrations open for uh, our participants who want to do some of the more detailed workshops? Uh, Larry may be able to pop some of the information in the, the chat there if you're interested yeah, in the links there. Oh, so great. Uh, all right, I'm going to start with one question, then we're going to get to our questions from the chat here. Uh, my curiosity was just a lot of the, what we are hearing now is about dinosaur behavior, but how do you figure that out when we don't have the dinosaurs to look at? Like what tools or techniques would a paleontologist use? Well, basically being a paleontologist is like trying to solve murder mysteries. You've, you've got these bones, it's the result of a death, often it's the result of a murder, and you're trying to reconstruct what happened. Obviously, behavior doesn't fossilize, um, at least mm -hmm. most of the time, but sometimes you get clues. So trackways are a good example. If you've got dinosaur tracks, you can look at how they're spaced to see how the animals walked. You can see how far apart they are to see how fast they were moving, things like that. And then we also interpret behavior by looking at modern animals. So animals today with horns, for the most part, don't use them to beat up on predators. They use them to compete with members of their own kind to sort of show off to the girls or to fight the, the males are fighting against each other. So we right. can look at modern analogs to figure out what the dinosaurs are doing. So we use all these different techniques to try and sleuth together um, sort of scenes, whole ecosystems, and certainly the behaviors of these ancient animals. That's very cool. Yeah. Is there any behaviors that really stand out in your mind or is this is a weird dinosaur behavior that we've found? We found dinosaurs that burrow underground. Um, what? That, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, dinosaurs that laid eggs and then covered the eggs with vegetation that would rot and create heat because oh. if you're really big, like if you weigh three tons and you go sit on a nest of eggs, you're just going to have scrambled eggs, right? And so <laughs> if you put vegetation yeah. on them, then the rotting vegetation creates the heat. That's the idea. So it's things like that um, that are actually pretty remarkable. Oh, amazing. Awesome. Well, Larry, do we have some questions coming in that you could pop one up? What have we got there? Someone was wondering. Sorry, I'm going to squint in for my old eyes. <laughs> uh, question for my kids who aren't from school yet. How do we become paleontologists? What kind of study do you need to do be, to become a you? Well, to, to become a paleontologist, I mean, it's one of these things that if you're young, the best thing you can do is learn all you can about nature and to actually get outside into nature and explore it. Paleontology is a science that sits on the cusp of two other major, kind, major sciences, geology on the one hand and biology on the other. So if in school, it's great to learn about both of those things. And then if once you get to university, you can start to specialize a little bit more. And of course, paleontology is way more than just dinosaurs. It's the study of ancient life. So that could be everything from redwood trees to bacteria. And there are paleontologists that specialize in all the different areas of life, but in fossils. And so these are plants and animals and microbes that have been dead for typically at least hundreds of thousands, often millions of years. Mm. So studying something that's not necessarily a dinosaur like a, a mammoth from the Ice Age, would it be paleontologists who are looking at those bones and studying those bones? Yep. Anything, the, about the only kind of animal that's been dead for years that we don't typically put into the paleontology category is if they're relatives of humans. And we call those people anthropologists and they study early human evolution. But really those people are paleontologists too because they're studying fossils. And so anything from the ice age that we know today, those are still fossils as well. So yep, all those people are paleontologists. 
Uh, Larry is our technician in the background, making everything go so wonderfully here. Uh, Larry, have you got another question for us? Oh, let's see. Uh, daughter Carolyn, age four, would like to know, how do you take care of the dinosaur bones that you find? Oh, and her favorite, oh, my goodness. Ornithomimus. <laughs> Scott, can you pronounce that one for us? Ornithomimus, bird okay. mimic. And it actually looks just like an ostrich. Um, and probably even had feathers like an ostrich. I mean, they are dead ringers for ostriches, probably the fastest of the dinosaurs too. So how do you take care of dinosaur bones? Well, first of all, I need to say that a lot of people think that because I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, if you were to come to my house, you would find all the rooms full of dinosaur bones. And that's just not true. <laughs> what? Um, it's not true. Almost, almost all the dinosaur bones I have ever found, and there's been thousands of them, go into museums. If we collect them at all, they go into museums. And that a few of them go on exhibit. I have a skull that I found in Madagascar that's on exhibit in the, at the Field Museum in Chicago. But most fossils go into collections areas. And they get a number and they get a label so that you can find out who found it, where they found it, um, what expedition was part of it, what the ground was like around it. So all this information so that people can go back later and try and answer questions with those fossils. Um, and to take care of them before they even get to the collection, they usually go through a room called the prep lab. And that's where you get rid of all the, all the dirt and the rock and you glue the fossils back together very, very carefully. That's the work you don't want to do when you're out in the field because it's just too dirty and you're going to mess it up. And so you leave that to the preparators back in the lab, many of whom are volunteers who just learn how to do this. And they might take years to prepare a single fossil. That's how pain painstaking the work can be sometimes. Sounds like being good at jigsaw puzzles would also be a skill. Yes, we like those people. <laughs> I know for some like artwork in museums, there would be a lot of like climate control type of uh, caretaking for so that it can last a really long time. Is the same sort of thing existent with dinosaur fossils and things that we find? In general, it's um, the the requirements are less strict for fossils and rocks than they are for more recent animal remains because like they're rocks, right? But there are still things that can happen to them. Um, and they can get what's called pyrite disease and the rocks start mm -hmm. to come apart and this pyrite starts to grow in them and things like that. And you can sometimes take care of that. But for the most part, fossils are a lot more robust than other kinds of collections. And mm -hmm. you, know, you, you try and control the temperature so it's not varying all the time because that can be hard on fossils. But for the most part, it's not too bad. Oh, thank you. Amazing. All right, Larry, what's our next question? You want to take this one? Yeah, Parker? I'll take it. Okay. Does combined dinosaurs exist? Oh, like hybrid between a T Rex and a Stegosaurus. So uh, I'm thinking of sort of like dogs almost. Like, do they, do dinosaurs crossbreed and create new breeds of dinosaurs? Well, in biology in general, the whole thing about different species is, in the, is that they don't interbreed. So you don't get an ostrich interbreeding with a wolf and creating a wastrich or whatever you'd call it. <laughs> so, um, so if they're separate, if they're that different, no, they don't, the hybrids don't exist. Having said that, once things start to go apart, they sometimes come back together. And that's when you can get hybrids. And it happens in plants and it happens in animal populations where they're starting to form different things, but they haven't been separated long enough that there's like a, a biological line between them. And, and if they come back together, even if they try to interbreed, they, they wouldn't be successful. So um, you wouldn't get a mix between a T-Rex and a Stegosaurus. Well, for one thing, they never saw each other. They lived millions and millions of years apart. But even if you said sort of T-Rex and Triceratops that lived at the same time, um, that would pretty, be a pretty unusual um, uh, uh, pairing, shall we say, and uh, no, no, they would not result in hybrids. Do paleontologists generally agree with each other? Like, is, is it kind of standard that this is how everything went, or are there disagreements in the field? It, 
it would be a better question to ask do paleontologists ever agree on anything um <laughs> I mean, and in part, like that's this is how science works, right? You know, somebody makes a hypothesis and they offer evidence to support it, and other people come along and they tap into their own knowledge and their own data and their own imaginations to test that other person's idea, and often they counter it. And I mean, if you just look at T. Rex, right, the subject of your exhibit, I mean, people disagree about almost everything about T-Rex. I mean, it, how fast it could move, whether it had feathers, whether it traveled in packs, whether it was a predator or a scavenger, how it used its tiny little arms. Paleontologists disagree on all those things. So the interesting thing is that the science does progress, but it progresses pretty slowly. And sometimes we take a big step back and, we, and things that we took for granted people go, whoa, that wasn't true at all. Like we used to think T-Rex stood upright and then people right. realized, nah, the bones don't work that way and it couldn't walk that way. It wouldn't work dragging its tail on the ground. So it held its body horizontal with the legs underneath it and the body was balanced on the hips basically. And it's one reason it had such a long tail. So the hypotheses change over time and the science evolves with it. All right, what's another question there, Larry? Oh, take it, Parker. Ooh, how do we know what dinosaurs ate? Well, um, teeth for the most part. That's the biggest thing. Um, you can tell often what a, any animal eats by looking at its teeth. And then in case of dinosaurs, you can compare it to animals today. So if you look at the teeth here of this Tyrannosaurus, they're sharp. If you could zoom in on them, you would see the teeth are serrated. Um, the teeth of T-Rex are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, one person described them as lethal bananas. They're like the size of a <laughs> banana, but they have serrations on them. They're like almost a foot long. They're crazy. And it had the strongest bite of any animal that ever lived, as far as we know. Somebody calculated the bite, and I think it's like 12,000 pounds of force. It's basically the equivalent of having a medium-sized elephant sit on you. That's the bite force of a T-Rex. Wow. So, um, so yeah, that's we look at the teeth, and if they're sharp teeth, it's typically a predator. If they're flatter teeth, it's usually a herbivore, a plant eater, and they use those for crushing and grinding. Um, but just, every once in a while, we get surprises because we can test our ideas by looking at what's preserved in the guts of dinosaurs. It's one thing to say, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it ate eucalyptus trees. And then you go and you find insects in its gut and you go, oh, well, I guess we were wrong on that one. So you can sometimes <laughs> test your own hypotheses, but teeth are the usual way. Cool. Oh, amazing. Love it. I, for some reason, had it in my mind that the T-Rex is like chomping on like whole trees and that that amount of force would be able to crush up the bark and just somehow digest the bark. But I think uh, just as you were saying, bones have been found in T-Rex fossilized poop. That kind of knocks that theory of mine. <laughs> you could have the occasional tree eater out there. Who knows? All right. What's our next question, Larry? Uh, it looks like we have Jordan and Jacob. We're wondering uh, how long does a typical oh how long does a typical tick typical tick take to finish? Uh, Twelve and ten years old. So a typical dig out in the field can be anywhere from an afternoon to a couple of months. I mean, I was involved in digging up a complete T-Rex one time in Montana, and we worked for, there was a team of about 10 of us, and we worked for six weeks to dig up that T-Rex. So it can take a while. And then sometimes these fossils are so um, um, inappropriate, they get buried under 50 feet of rock, and then we have to come along and take pickaxes and shovels and jackhammers and we can take two weeks just to take down the rock to the level where the fossils are so it's a lot of hard work sometimes digging up dinosaurs out there 
Um, but it can, it really does vary. It can be very short or very long. Cool. Yeah, I love it. Larry, I think we have some more. Oh, nice. Uh, I want to thank everybody too. These are phenomenal questions. We're loving them. Uh, so we have uh, <laughs> asking, how do fossils get made? Uh, Sloan's question, uh, he's in grade one, Sloan is. Oh, amazing. Hello, Sloan. So how do fossils get made? How do fossils get made? So if you ever wanted to aspire to become a fossil yourself, you don't want to die at the top of a mountain. You don't want to die typically on a beach or in a forest. You want to go somewhere where you're going to get buried quickly. And, and that's, what animal, that's what happens with animals that, are, that become fossils. They typically die near rivers or near some kind of water source that floods carrying mud and covers them relatively quickly. And then once they're in the mud, they become rock and then more layers get deposited on them and, that, and then they get preserved. It's hard to become a fossil, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of all the animals and plants that have ever lived became fossils. So um, that's, it's that being covered over by dirt or mud that then becomes rock later on and then more rock gets piled on top. So is there a way for me to make a fossil at home? I have a leaf or I have a, a, a pet caterpillar that has passed. Is there anything that I could do to fossilize them in my lifetime? Or no, are they, are they stuck as a sort of biological remains uh, for at least my lifetime? Uh, it's probably going to be, I mean, given that there's, it's very rare to form a fossil in less than 100,000 years. Um, Parker, maybe mm. you've made a deal with the devil or something and you're going to live a long, <laughs> long time. But, but assuming that's not the case, um, it's going to be really hard to do that. But having said that, you can do cool things. Like you can get... Um, a little container, put plaster in it while the plaster is still wet. You can get a leaf or a snail or whatever and just very carefully push it into the plaster. And then when it dries, you can take out the leaf or the whatever and you'll have an impression of it that's just like a fossil. It's pretty cool. Very cool. Oh, oh, thank you so much. Oh, brilliant. All right, all right nice. All right. Uh, does Oh my goodness, geologists, or oh, do geologists study dinosaurs too? That's the question there. Yeah, it's really interesting. I would say about half of the paleontologists I know work in geology departments at universities, and the other half typically work in more biology departments. And so there's lots of geologists that study dinosaurs. And typically they don't study the bones themselves, although sometimes they do often they study the rocks around the bones because the rocks tell you what the environment was like. Was it a forest? Was it a desert? Was it near the ocean? What kind of trees live there? What, what other kinds of um, animals and plants live there? The geologists often try and reconstruct the environments that the dinosaurs lived in. And there's a whole science, a whole part of paleontology called taphonomy. It's all about what's happened to fossils, um, to what happened to, for, to that fossil for it to become a fossil. And you, you get to reconstruct the environments doing these things. So it's a really important part of paleontology, the work that geologists do. Great question. Oh, nice. What, uh, just out of curiosity, yes. what angle did you come at uh, paleontology with? More of a geology love or a biology love or? I... I came at it from a biology love, and I have always had this thing about nature since I was a little kid. Paleontology is one of the first words I learned how to spell. There was literally a period in my life where I could reliably spell the word paleontology and not my last name. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and so I, I pursued biology, even in through university. And then when I got my first academic job, it was in a geology department. So it just shows that people go back and forth in this field. I want to ask you about a dinosaur that we have on display or replicas on display here is the uh, Cosmoceratops. Um, were you involved in some of the discovery or naming around that one? Oh, 
Ryan, you were so nice to bring up my favorite dinosaur. People always ask me, what's your favorite dinosaur, Dr. Scott? And I always say this animal. And I did not discover it. It was discovered by another Scott, actually, a fellow by the name of Scott Richardson. Um, he found it in southern Utah um, in a place called Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And I started a major paleontology project down there. And we dug up this dinosaur. In fact, we've dug up another four or five horned dinosaurs with it. But Cosmoceratops is easily the most wondrous. To my mind, Cosmoceratops blows Triceratops away. Triceratops, three horns on its head. One on the nose, one over each eye. Cosmoceratops, 15 horns on its head. No. One on the nose, one on each cheek, one over each eye, and then 10 across the back of the frill. Um, and they were probably used for showing off, mostly. So it is a, just an amazing creature. And you think about a skull that can grow up to like six feet long. These horned dinosaurs, some of them had the biggest skulls of any land living animals ever. Um, and they're just phenomenal creatures. So there's a look at, at, a, at the skull. Um, it was incredible. When we found this thing and we dug it up, we were just doing cartwheels. It was, um, and I, well, I don't do cartwheels, but if I could have <laughs> done a cartwheel, I would have. Um, so, Figurative. Yeah, that's right. So they're, they're plant eaters and they, had these, they have these batteries of teeth. There's hundreds of teeth in those jaws and they constantly replace them. They would just wear them out. So no need to brush your teeth if you're a dinosaur like Cosmoceratops, you just constantly lose teeth and you replace them. And you, those teeth are really good for chewing up tough fibrous vegetation into small bites that you can swallow. So just remarkable animals. They're fabulous, fabulous. If you wanna check out that replica of the Cosmoceratops skull, come by Science World, you can yeah. see it up in the search gallery. Uh, I think we've got time for a few more questions. Who have we got, Larry? Uh, let's see, from Ryan B. Thank you so much, Ryan B. Uh, were iguanodons the only dinosaurs with thumb spikes? Wow. I don't think I have ever been asked that question. I've been <laughs> asked a lot of questions. Um, I can't think of another dinosaur that has a thumb spike. Well, no, maybe there is. I think there are some of the big brontosaur, sauropod dinosaurs, the long neck ones. There's some that have spikes on in the thumb position there on their hands that some people think were used for fending things off. Even with Iguanodon, when they first found it, they actually, the spike wasn't on the hand, it was just isolated and they stuck it on the nose. They thought it, that it went on the nose instead. And then somebody found one with the big, you know, Fonzie, hey, well, <laughs> dating myself with that, but um, with the big thumb spikes on there, and they think they were used probably as weapons um, to help defend themselves, because when you weigh three tons and you can't run fast and there's big predators around, you have to find other ways of surviving. Oh, brilliant, love it. I think we have, let's do a couple more if we can. So you have a lot of good, again, thank you everybody. These are really phenomenal questions. We love them oh, so much. All right, I think we've got Jamie. What was the fastest dinosaur? And this is from Henry. Henry's wondering the fastest oh, nice. dinosaur. I think the fastest dinosaurs that we know of are those ones that we talked about earlier. And the group is called Ornithomimosaurs, the bird mimics. And there's a whole bunch of them. There's Struthiomimus, the ostrich mimic. There's many of them, but they're the ones you can always tell the fast running animals because they tend to have a short upper leg and a really long lower leg. And those are the animals that can run the fastest. And you think about animals today in Africa, like ostriches, like cheetahs, they're all like that. And um, so we think that those were easily the fastest of the dinosaurs. And things like T-Rex, probably couldn't run, although some, some of the movies, it looks like they're running 60 miles an hour. They probably couldn't run more than about 10, 12, 13 miles an hour, about as fast as a human can run. Now, if there's bird-like dinosaurs, are there dinosaur-like birds? Uh, yes. Um, some of the earliest birds known, the most famous one, I don't have a copy of it here. The most famous one is Archaeopteryx, 
um, which is one of the first known birds. And it's got a long bony tail, um, like a dinosaur. The claws, it has teeth, which most birds don't today. So it is a dinosaur-like bird. And it makes sense that they would be that way because in fact, birds are dinosaurs. It's not that they're closely related, it's that dinosaurs are not extinct. There are in fact more kinds of dinosaurs alive today than there are mammals alive today. About 10,000 kinds of birds would, and birds are dinosaurs and only about 6,000 kinds of mammals. So it makes sense that birds are a lot like dinosaurs because they are dinosaurs. So that means if you're having chicken tonight, you're having dinosaur for dinner. And even in terms of numbers, I read a, an astounding statistic recently that by weight, chickens outweigh almost all other birds in the world combined, which is a pretty sad statement about what we've done to birds around the world. So mm -hmm. in the future, when people dig up fossils from the age of humans, they're going to find all these dinosaurs in the forms of in the form of chickens, which is kind of bizarre. <laughs> well, Larry, why don't we try one more question here? Nice, Gavin, age seven. Thank you, Gavin. Amazing. Uh, what dino? What discovery or accomplishment are you most proud of? And their favorite. Let's see. It is Gavin's favorite dino is a pyroraptor. So, what discovery or accomplishment are you most proud of, Dr. Scott? Um. It's an animal that I mentioned earlier that's on exhibit in Chicago, and we found it on the island of Madagascar. People had found hundreds of isolated teeth. Remember I told you that dinosaurs are constantly dropping teeth. And so we knew that there was a, a meat-eating dinosaur on the island, but nobody had found it. And I set it out that I was going to go find this thing. And um, I would look, walk it around one day and found the tailbones of a carnivore sticking out of the hill. And I dug in and there was another one and another one and another one. And I thought, oh my gosh, the whole thing is here. And I got super excited and we got people over and we dug in and we came across a leg bone. And I thought, this is it. This is the whole skeleton. And then I realized the leg bone was from a big brontosaur type dinosaur, a totally different thing. And I thought, oh, it's just a jumble of bones from different animals. It's not a skeleton at all. And then later that same day, I was had my pick and my hammer, and I took, um, knocked some rock off and lifted it up. And there was a beautiful jaw with all the teeth gleaming back at me. So it's the first time any human had ever seen this thing since it was buried 67 million years ago. And all the rest of the skull was there perfectly preserved that had never been distorted. When we got it back to North America, we prepared it, we made copies of all the bones and they fit together like a kid's kit. It was that perfect. And it's one of the best, one of the most complete, least distorted dinosaur skulls probably known. It's, it's a really good one. So I don't think I'll ever top that one. That's pretty cool. Oh, Larry says we got time for an extra question here. Let's pop that one up. All right. Uh, when did the dinosaurs die? Well, that's interesting. When did the dinosaurs Birds. Die? Well, there was this giant asteroid about 10 kilometers across that slammed into the Gulf of Mexico on a really bad day about 66 million years ago. Within a short period of time, all the dinosaurs sort of in North America were gone, but then there's a big cloud of gas and dust went up circled the earth and it was probably dark for weeks and weeks so sunlight couldn't get through the plants couldn't grow so the plant eaters died off the meat eaters then died off and so that was the big extinction of dinosaurs and the only ones that made it through as far as we know are the birds and mm -hmm. so they're still around but that was the big extinction but the really interesting thing is that was just one bad day 66 million years ago Dinosaurs were around for well over 200 million years, and it was not the same dinosaurs. They were changing the whole time. So species of dinosaurs died thousands of times before that bad day with the asteroid. That just happened to be the one that took out the world of dinosaurs. And if that asteroid hadn't hit, the dinosaurs would probably still be here, and we wouldn't. Yeah. This would be hosted by a couple of dinosaurs. Yeah. Instead. Oh, man, that would be great. But also sad because I wouldn't be here. There you go. 
Uh, thank you all again for your fantastic questions. Thank you, Dr. Scott, for being here with us. Uh, if you are interested in dinosaurs, if you're in the Vancouver area, feel free to check us out here at Science World. If you're around San Francisco, check out the California Academy of Science. So we mentioned Chicago, the Field Museum has a wonderful yeah. collection. Um, Scott, anywhere else you'd recommend people go if they want to scratch their um, dinosaur itch? The American Museum of Natural History in New York, the Smithsonian, our very own in Canada, the Royal Ontario Museum is really good. The National Museum in Ottawa also has amazing fossils. And of course, closer, closest of all to British Columbia is the Royal Tyrrell Museum mm. in Drumheller um, in Alberta. Really a remarkable place. One of the best dinosaur museums in the world. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Uh, we will see you again. We will. So we'll hopefully see you on November's online family event. And we'll give Dr. Scott a big thank you and goodbye. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott. Thanks, everybody. Have an amazing thank rest you of your all. day. Bye. Pleasure.